Snow. Also, uh, we did not get page numbers this time around, so just okay. a note to number your pages. Oh, good call. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, could you uh, count to 10 for a mic check? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Crow, you too now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I gosh, I should tell a joke. What, what jo I did the Switzerland joke last time. Do the Switzerland joke this time. <laughs> it's terrible. You might as well repeat it as many times as possible. Does it, do, you remember, do you remember the Switzerland joke? What's the best thing about Switzerland? Uh, what? I don't know, but the flag's a big plus. Yep. That, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> that's terrible. So many technical problems. Uh, yeah. You know, it just, yeah. It, unfortunately, it was a kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. But did it, it was it was an English. No, it was, it was an English. English. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they were, they did both. So they asked the question in Spanish, and they asked gotcha. it in, in English, and then there was supposed to be a translation, but the equipment wasn't working, and yeah. Gotcha. So there were. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> when they talk to us in Spanish, and then they, they uh, dub my Spanish in Spanish. Colorado's 6th Congressional District is home to America's most expensive house race. Republican Congressman Mike Kaufman and his Democratic challenger Jason Crow. More than $17 million spent to sway your vote. Think about it like this. Spread out over our 30-minute debate, that's nearly $10,000 a second. 
Now ignore the outflux of inside money. This is about the issues, about your vote. It's about these men who share a history of service to our country, yet have very different ideas on how to lead in the future. This is Decision 2018, the race for Congress. Tonight's moderators are Nine News anchor Kyle Clark and Nine News political reporter Marshall Zellinger. Good evening and welcome to the Nine News debate in the 6th Congressional District. I'm Kyle Clark. And I'm Marshall Zellinger. Thanks to Nine News for the use of this beautiful studio. <laughs> I'd like to introduce our candidates, Republican Congressman Mike Kaufman, Democratic challenger Jason Crow. We invite you at home to share your thoughts on tonight's debate using the debate hashtag CO6Debate. Tonight's questions have not been shared with the candidates in advance. They will get 45 seconds to answer most questions, and there's a countdown clock visible to the candidates, and sometimes you'll see that clock at home. By a flip of the coin, Mr. Crow will have the first closing statement at the end of the debate. No offense, gentlemen, you've had a lot of time to recite your standard talking points at campaign events and forums and in ads, so what we're looking to do, to do tonight is to cover some new ground for voters, so we're not going to be shy about interrupting or interjecting if any of these topics stray away from the question. We want to begin tonight with some news that's happening while we're on the air. This is the 60,000 missing ballots, a literal truckload of them that vanished, and a lot of these ballots were headed to your voters in the 6th Congressional District. So here's where we stand as of 7 p.m. Tuesday the 23rd. The ballots have been found, all of them, and they're being mailed out to voters right now. And this issue only came to light because voters in Adams County complained that they didn't get their mail-in ballots. Republican County Clerk Stan Martin initially blamed the Postal Service, which said it never got the ballots. Now the clerk saying this missing truck was never unloaded and instead was sitting at a trucking company lot for a week. The clerk says the seals on the trailer show that no one tampered with the ballots. We have lots of other issues that we can move along to unless either of you have any concerns that this is going to impact the elections or that anything other than an honest mistake happened here. Any concerns like that? You know, well, I, I, obviously there is a concern in terms of accountability, and, and I think that uh, we obviously realize that this problem occurred, uh, but, but uh, we still, I think, want accountability in terms of, of making sure that these ballots get out, making sure that the voters have adequate time uh, to vote. They, they've uh, been shorted about a week or so. Mm -hmm. It's a developing story. We obviously need more information to make a full assessment about mm -hmm. what happened. And uh, you know, I think once we get that information, we'll see what needs to be done to make sure voters have the opportunity and the time that they need to cast their, their votes. All right, we're going to keep asking questions about that. But let's talk about health care right now. Sure. Uh, President Trump says that Republicans are protecting people with pre-existing conditions. Yet tomorrow, the Trump administration is going to roll back requirements which will allow states to get around pre-existing conditions coverage. So individual states could then offer cheaper plans that don't cover things like maternity care or mental health or pre-existing conditions. First to you, Mr. Kaufman, do you support this decision to give states and consumers this workaround choice? Now, without a requirement to protect uh, pre-existing conditions, I was not able to vote uh, for the bill. Uh, there was a MacArthur Amendment added to it. I was concerned about pre-existing conditions, talked to experts here in Colorado. Uh, we came up with language to fix that provision. Uh, it was not accepted, uh, so I was not able to vote for the bill. But I, I introduced legislation back when I was the Colorado legislature to protect pre-existing conditions. I think it's very important, and I think it's a, it's a right that people ought to have. All right, Mr. Crow, what do you think about this idea of allowing states to offer some plans that don't cover pre-existing conditions? I disagree with it. I think in America, nobody should go bankrupt or die because they can't afford health care or because they have a pre-existing condition. You know, my own wife has a pre-existing condition, so this is an issue that's personal to us, just like it is the thousands of families throughout the 6th Congressional District. You know, my opponent has a long history of working to gut the Affordable Care Act. He voted 17 times to repeal it entirely, including protections on pre-existing conditions. Uh, so I do not have any confidence that if Mike Kaufman were to go back to Washington, D.C. for the next two years, that he would protect that and the other essential elements of the Affordable Care Act. I, I want to give you the opportunity to, to respond, Mr. Kaufman, um, because you have been on both sides of this in terms of whether the ACA should be protected or not. So how did you come to the position where you are now? And what do you say to Mr. Crow's charge that he doesn't trust you to go back and stay consistent to your vows to protect well, it? Well, I, I, I certainly uh, voted uh, for H.R. 826, guaranteed health coverage for pre-existing conditions, and that in the event of any repeal, that there would be a protection, that uh, protection of pre-existing conditions would be, uh, would be in, intact. 
uh, you, Mr. Crow uh, supports all of the Affordable Care Act. He supported the Independent Payment Advisory Board that said that when Medicare growth rates exceeded a certain benchmark, that a 15-member uh, uh, unelected board of bureaucrats could then cut Medicare benefits. I think that's wrong. Staying with the Affordable Care Act, Mr. Kaufman, you've criticized the ACA's Medicaid expansion as unsustainable. Republicans in Congress are right now talking about cuts to Medicaid and other entitlement programs to deal with the deficit. So who specifically is on Medicaid in Colorado that you think needs to come off? Well, the way it's the way it was written. All traditional Medicaid programs are at a 50-50 split. Uh, the, the disabled, uh, children, uh, low income. Uh, the difference between the Medicaid expansion, the, the new entitlement created under the Affordable Care Act, is it's 90% federal, 10% state. My position is it should be treated like any other Medicaid program at 50-50 split. So should everybody who's on Medicaid in Colorado should stay on then? Uh, I've not said that they should, that anybody should get off, but that the formulas had changed, that Medicaid expansion should be treated like all other traditional Medicaid programs. Thank you for staying on time there. Congressman. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Crow, like Democratic gubernatorial candidate Jared Polis, you support moving the U.S. toward universal health care. Do you support the Medicare for All plan proposed by Bernie Sanders? I don't support that program because everywhere I go throughout the district, people want more options, not less. Costs are way too high for ma the majority of Coloradans. People are paying $1,000, $1,100, uh, $1,200 a month to cover a family of four with very high deductibles. My proposal is we need to protect the Affordable Care Act because it's not a perfect system. We have to get costs under control, but there are a lot of great elements of that program that need to be defended. And then we need to go to a federal public option. We need to have a Medicare-based public option that folks under 65 can buy into, that's an expanded version of that, to increase competition and decrease costs within the individual market. Mr. Crow, you said costs high, keep costs under control, so how do you propose to pay for your version of universal health care? Well, we obviously need to have the subsidies and, and grants to make sure that everyone can buy into that. I believe that if we decrease uh, costs by increasing competition, that everyone's going to have more money available to uh, pay for health care and to get the health care they need, and they're going to have to spend less out-of-pocket to do it. Uh, unlike my opponent, I don't want to go to a block grant for the Medicaid expansion. Right? He wants to block grant it, which will inevitably mean uh, less money available to the states and rationing of care. So you don't foresee any new money coming from Congress to pay for this? There might have to be initially, uh, but we'll have to see how that settles out once you add the expanded version of Medicare into the individual market. But I believe we're going to see a very rapid decrease of costs because that will interject a high degree of competition into that market that doesn't exist in a lot of counties. Okay. Uh, let's discuss immigration issues. So there's a, a caravan of Central American migrants that's making its way through southern Mexico with the intent of coming to the United States. And, and President Trump has been very vocally stoking fears of this immigrant invasion. If these people arrive in the U.S., presumably a number of them are going to ask for asylum. And it's not out of the question that a number of them might want to come live in the very diverse 6th Congressional District. So first to you, Mr. Kaufman, would you welcome them here? Well, first of all, uh, let's let's uh, face the facts that this is a humanitarian crisis, that, that they are, in fact, uh, fleeing uh, uh, poverty and violence uh, in Central America. Um, uh, I support secure borders. Uh, my, uh, my opponent, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Jason Crow, support open borders. Uh, I do believe that we can address this problem uh, by, uh, uh, right now, there's a tremendous shortage of seasonal workers in the United States uh, where there are not enough Americans to fill jobs in hospitality, uh, in, in agriculture, in landscaping, and other areas like this. It's a very good program, but there are not, but there are not enough uh, workers there. We, need, we can expand it to meet the economic needs here and, and dedicate those new numbers to uh, those That's impoverished areas of Central I, I want to continue because I don't think that I heard an answer to the question. The question is, there are these people coming up from Central America who some of them are looking for economic opportunity, some of them are fleeing violence. Would you welcome them in the 6th Congressional? And they're not looking for seasonal work. They're looking to come and stay here and live. That's the question. Uh, no. The, well, the answer is this. I mean, th no, I, I think my answer is that there is a different solution uh, for it. Uh, and, and I think that that's where, we, and I've, I've had a meeting uh, last week with four 
um, mayors from El Salvador who told me that a big part of their economy is remittances coming from uh, uh, El Salvadorans here in the United States uh, sending money back home. I, I think that there is another solution. I don't think that's the solution. You don't think that the solution is admitting them to the United States? We have to. We are a nation of laws, and, and we do have to fix our broken immigration system, but we have to recognize the laws that we have, and we do have laws uh, uh, relative to political asylum. I, I'm not entirely certain that we got an answer, but we, we did hear a bit. So l let's examine this issue with you, Mr. Crow. These folks coming in, Welcome them in the sixth, and most, most specifically, what should the U.S. government do if and when they reach the border? Well, first off, uh, you know, Mike Kaufman just said that I support open borders. That's just patently false. I mean, just last night we had a debate where I talked about the need for strong border security and the various mechanisms that we can go about to, to achieve that border security. I, I, unlike him, I don't believe in spending $25 billion on Donald Trump's wall. But what, what the first step is we have to be working with Mexico right now to make sure that uh, we're addressing the humanitarian crisis component of this. I would like to see those folks seek asylum in Mexico. Uh, and I think we need to be working with the country of Mexico to, to make that happen. If some of them do reach the border, we should treat them the same as we would anyone seeking asylum. There is a legal standard for that. We would process those folks. We would determine whether or not individuals qualify for asylum. That's time, but again, just looking for a clear answer. Should they meet that legal requirement, you would welcome them in the sixth? Yes. Okay. Mr. Crow, question for you again. How Democrats have talked about impeaching President Trump. In fact, there was a motion to begin impeachment that was previously introduced. Based on what you know now, if a similar resolution is introduced again, would you vote to start impeachment proceedings against President Trump? I, I wouldn't. I mean, I'm a, I'm a rule of law person. I believe we're in a very sensitive time in our nation's history right now. Uh, we need to be supporting due process in the rule of law. And I don't believe it's appropriate right now to mix what is a political process, impeachment is a political process, with an ongoing law enforcement investigation. The priority of Congress has to be to protect the Mueller investigation, make sure there's no political interference in that investigation, so that we can get the complete facts, understand what happened, and, and how we move forward as a country. And, and protecting the Mueller investigation is something that I believe you have agreement with your uh, opponent on. Let me ask you, in just our remaining moments here, there's also talk about starting impeachment proceedings against Associate Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Jerry Nadler, House member, has talked about that. Would you support, based on what you now know now, impeachment proceedings against Kavanaugh? No, I don't agree with that either. I think we need to be making sure that we get facts and that there are investigations. There's an ethics investigation going on, actually, through the Tenth Circuit that was referred by Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, there, there are uh, inv investigators looking into ethics violations. Uh, that should uh, be allowed to continue. Uh, but we really have to be careful about how we move forward. And I think we need leadership in America right now that helps us unite as a country and figure out how we can repair the deep rifts that are developing in our nation. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman, one month before the 2016 election, you texted me that then-candidate Trump should step aside after that Access Hollywood video became public, the one where the president bra bragged about grabbing women by their genitals. Have you ever had a face-to-face -face conversation with President Trump? I've been in a meeting with the president, but not, I wouldn't say, an individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation. Uh, the American people uh, spoke through the election, and they elected uh, Donald Trump. Uh, when I disagree with the president, I stand up to the president. When I agree with the president, I work with the president. If you had a minute with him tomorrow, what would you tell him? I would tell him, uh, uh, let's uh, get Im immigration reform done. Uh, let's have a path to citizenship for, for the dreamers. Uh, let's have a path to citizenship for those under temporary uh, protected status, the El Salvadoran community that is here. Uh, my opponent just referenced uh, uh, my uh, voting for a bill that funded the, the president's border security plan. That was an exchange for uh, path to citizenship for the dreamers that was in that same bill. He would not have voted for that. I voted for that. Do you think you would have to talk with him at all about any of the social issues, the, the, the highlights that we see on TV, the way he talks, the thing that bothered you right, right. before he was elected? The president is not going to change. Uh, I think he's made that very clear to the American people. I don't like his tone. Uh, I wish it were different. Uh, but but uh, the president is not going to change. Okay. Mr. Crow, there's been a lot of talk for a lot of years over whether Congressman Kaufman has been willing to break with the Republican Party enough 
in reflection of the fact that the 6th Congressional District is a moderate district when you put all, all the people together. And I would assume that it would be fair to ask the exact same question of an elected Democrat in the district. So I, I need to ask you then, where specifically would you have broken with Democratic Party leaders, specifically the House agenda of Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi? Specific examples, please. Yeah, so I, I'm not a career politician. I've never served in office before, but I'm not afraid to work across party lines. You know, I did that when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, served with a very diverse unit. And there's a lot of things over the course of uh, the last six to eight years where I've broken with the party. I was very clear that I didn't believe the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was the right thing to do. It didn't have environmental protections, it didn't have good uh, labor standards, and most importantly, it didn't protect American workers and a manufacturing base. And that's something that I thought was a mistake, uh, and I'm glad that we're, we're revisiting that. Uh, actually, we should be. Donald Trump is not revisiting it and actually doing nothing to develop trade and alliances in that region right now. Another example? Uh, uh, the military, right? You know, we, we, are, uh, we have been at war for 17 years now, and uh, as a result of that, a lot of our, our prime weapon systems and our infrastructure within the military has been degraded and needs to be replaced. I think that we need to look at making the investments we need so that we have the lethal forth, force that's capable of defending this nation. Mr. Crow, thank you. Mr. Kaufman, another one for you. What's the benefit of sending you back to Congress for your second decade? What are you known for? Well, I have served uh, in the Congress of the United States for 10 years. Uh, this last session, uh, I passed four bills. Uh, the President of the United States will sign another bill that I just passed uh, next year uh, for uh, women veterans. Uh, as we increase the number of active duty uh, women, uh, we've not uh, plussed up uh, the VA, and so my bill plusses up the VA in terms of mental health counselors to, to work with women uh, to make sure uh, to deal with them in substance abuse issues, uh, suicide, uh, prevention, uh, homelessness, uh, uh, as well as uh, those that are sexual assault victims. And so I've been uh, uh, focused uh, on making sure that we have the best led, best trained, best equipped military in the world, uh, meeting our nation's obligations to the men and women served our, our military, uh, and have fought for immigration reform. That's time. Uh, Mr. Crow, you've made a point to let voters know you're not taking any PAC money. This is a popular theme for many Democratic candidates. That's money from special interest groups. However, PACs on their own are producing political ads that are attacking your opponent. So why not tell those groups, nope, I'm good. I don't need you producing these ads that perhaps could help me win this election. Yeah, you know, last year uh, I actually challenged Mike Kaufman to come to an agreement with me and said, uh, you know, together we should lead by example and run a clean campaign and show that we can move forward as a country without that money and have it be about ideas. I, I challenged him to, with me, reject that money, and he never responded. But that has nothing to do with telling the PACs that are producing political ads attacking your opponent, why don't you come out and say, I don't want you to do that? Because we need to do that together. Right, if we're going to have a clean campaign that's about the issues that are facing this community, we should be able to together come to an agreement and say, let's lead by example. Let's step up and run this campaign the right way. So if, if he has PAC money attacking you, that's why you let PAC money attack him? You know, it, you, know you can't coordinate with these groups at all. But I said, let's stand up together and do it. Mr. Well, first of all, he, he does take uh, corporate PAC money, and if, and if the viewers go to my website at CoffinForCongress.com, it will show the reports uh, of the corporations that give to the leadership PACs in Washington, D.C., that give to uh, Jason Crow to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, will you give back those corporate PAC dollars to those corporations that you say you're not taking? Mr. Crow, I'll let you answer. You know, will you take a pledge not to take any corporate PAC money? You have taken almost that's two not the, million. But my, that's not my position. You have taken. It is the cornerstone of your campaign. It is the cornerstone of your campaign. No, this is about no, honor no, and integrity. No, this no, is about honesty. Talking over each other isn't going to help. This answer is about honesty. Here. Please answer, only, the answer the question. There is only one person sitting at this table right now who's taken corporate PAC money. Answer the and question. It's you to the tune of two million dollars. Answer the question. You're the one that says you're not going to take it. Two million dollars of corporate PAC. Answer the question. I'm going to follow up. Could you answer Mr. Kaufman's question about that? You know, I don't have control over what money other people take. Answer the question. I haven't taken a dime of corporate PAC money in my campaign. Look at my, you both. Well. So this seems like an opportune time to bring this up. It is clear that you gentlemen don't just have disagreements on policy, but both of you have accused the other at times of dishonesty and issues with integrity. 
You're both men who serve this country in uniform with distinction. I imagine you don't take those kinds of accusations lightly when you level them at other veterans. So why is it that you feel like you can accuse the other man of not just making poor choices, but being dishonest? We're going to hear from both of you on this. First, Mr. Kaufman. Sure, thank you. I, I think, first of all, take a look. Uh, his, his, uh, web, his bio was dramatically changed. To, to take out that he specialized in, in representing um, uh, white collar cr uh, corporate criminals uh, who had uh, stolen from uh, workers' pension funds, who had uh, embezzled from health care plans, and who had defrauded uh, a VA hospital. Uh, you know, it may be embarrassing, but, but it's, 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 there's no reference to what he does professionally uh, in his new af bio, the, uh, professional bio. Uh, then I think uh, this whole issue with these, this corporate PAC issue, he demonizes these political action committees uh, but, and says he does a cornerstone of his campaign, and yet he That's takes time. the money through uh, leadership PACs. Mr. Kaufman. Mr. Crow, why do you specifically believe that Mr. Kaufman is not just wrong but dishonest? You know, first of all, Kyle, you, you preface that question by referencing our service, and I'm going to say, you know, I honor Mike Hoffman's service. I've been very disappointed that he hasn't honored mine, but that's his decision to make. Uh, I'm going to continue to honor his. You know, the, his claims uh, about my background and the attacks that he's levied against me during this campaign have been repeatedly called false, dishonest, even shameful by local media. You know, uh, uh, and this comes at the same time that my opponent made the fundamental promise of his campaign two years ago, where he looked into the camera and said that if Donald Trump were elected president, he would stand up to Donald Trump. Well, now you fast forward two years later, and he has failed to keep that promise, and he has to be held accountable. Mr. Crow, thank you for staying on time. I'd like to each ask you a question from the mindset of an undecided voter. Sure. Somebody maybe who is not super political, but is interested enough in this race, seeing how it is the most expensive in the country. Mr. Kaufman, what would you say to a voter who's considering voting for you, but thinking, you know what, maybe I'll vote against him and all the Republicans to send a message to President Trump? Sure, that I've been an independent voice. I, I think I'm looking at uh, the Denver Post uh, editorial. I think they laid out an argument uh, very well that, that, that Mike Kaufman has been an independent voice standing with the president when he agrees with him, standing against the president uh, when he doesn't. Uh, Jason Crow uh, has, was picked by the uh, Democrat establishment in Washington, D.C. Uh, because he's never stood up to them, because he's always followed them. When they needed a, a veteran at the, the DNC, National Democrat Convention, uh, to speak in favor uh, of the Obama administration's handling of the VA, he did it, even though he knew that uh, that administration was not meeting our nation's obligations to the men and women who served our, our country. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman, for staying on time. Mr. Crow, the idea of an undecided voter here. So picture somebody who's considering voting for you, but thinking, you know what? If we vote all the moderates out of Congress, that's a bad idea. Well, first off, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Mike Kaufman's a moderate. You know, having a 96% voting record with Donald Trump, and that's not, that's not my number, by the way. That's, you know, the congressional record, every uh, position that Donald Trump has taken a, uh, a position on, legislation, 96% of the time he has been with Donald Trump. Uh, so that's not a moderate in my view. It, listen, the entire system has failed us, right? Republicans, Democrats, independents. I'm not a career politician. I've never run for anything before in my life. We need people who have run businesses, raised families, served the country, done things outside of politics, proven themselves in service to the country and community who can go to Washington and fix this mess. Mr. Crow, thank you for staying on time. Mr. Crow, brief question on the VA. You sat on the State Board of Veterans Affairs. Your website boasts that as a member, you led the charge to bring the VA hospital to Aurora. But that decision is made by the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington and with Congress. So what did you do to lead the charge? Well, we were working with uh, the statewide coalition of veterans leaders. I was the chairman of the Fitzsimmons Oversight Committee, which was uh, the committee that was empowered by the United Veterans Committee of Colorado. In Colorado, we have an umbrella group that all of the veterans work through uh, to try to advance legislation. And I uh, led the efforts to help draft a white paper that was presented by Ed Perlmutter to then Secretary Shinseki 
to make the case for a standalone veterans hospital because the VA actually wanted to go to a different model and integrate it with the hospital that was there. And we said, you know, you have to keep veterans care independent. You have to have a standalone system. And I helped uh, make the, the efforts, uh, you know, whole to do that. Brief follow-up. If you're going to take credit for that, shouldn't you shoulder the blame for it costing too much and taking too long? Well, you know, unlike uh, my opponent here, I haven't been sitting on the VA committee for the last five years. You know, the State Board of Veterans Affairs, which was a different effort from the white paper effort, uh, deals with state veterans issues. Uh, and, and you know, unlike the efforts of my opponent to, to, to fail to exercise proper oversight. I feel like it goes both ways. Mr. Kaufman, we've got about 45 seconds. Sure. Uh, uh, get, changing your mind is admirable in life, but scarlet letter in politics. Where are you today with a woman's right to choose to have an abortion? Uh, I'm pro-life. Uh, I believe in exceptions. Uh, rape, incest, life of the mother. Let me get uh, on the uh, VA hospital. Uh, I got um, the, the district was redrawn uh, in January 2013. The new district was, had the uh, VA hospital in it. Uh, I immediately recognized the problems, uh, led the fight to get the Army Corps of Engineers on the project. Uh, they brought it to completion. Uh, I got the cost overrun, I got the, the cost overruns funded, although we trimmed it back some and uh, led the fight to make sure uh, that the VA uh, never uh, build another hospital again without someone like the Army Corps. Thanks Virginia. for answering two questions there. And just this January, we learned that it's going to cost another, we are another several hundred million dollars. Up against our closings. Thank you both for staying on time. want to make sure both of you have time to make your closing arguments. By flip of a coin, Mr. Crow, you're first. Yep. I've never run for anything before. I'm a first-time candidate. I grew up in a working-class family and worked in construction to pay my way through college. I served this country during three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan as an Army Ranger, and now I'm the proud parent of a five-year-old and eight-year-old. This election is about environmental protections. Uh, it's about labor standards. It's about a woman's right to choose. It's about immigration reform. It's about health care. All of these critical issues facing our community are all on the table in the next few years. We need leadership who can go to Washington and hold this administration accountable. And, and fight for the values and fight for the important issues that are facing our community. We will not solve these issues and we will not stand up to Donald Trump by electing the same people like Mike Kaufman to go back to Washington and do what they've been doing for, for years in failing this community. And I would humbly ask for the support of the viewers. Mr. Kaufman, your closing statement. What I like about this job is helping families. Uh, Angela Becerra, uh, was a, a little girl who was adopted out of Peru uh, by two uh, um, American citizens who had gone down th there to work and uh, they found her abandoned uh, in an orphanage at, at 12 days old and uh, they went back and forth to the orphanage to take care of her and then uh, went through the Peruvian uh, court system to adopt her, even checking in with the American Embassy. Uh, got a visa to take her to the United States, uh, bought a home uh, in Aurora, and then we started to go through the naturalization process. But they were rejected by immigration authorities who wouldn't recognize her per the, the Peruvian adoption. And they, and they said that she had to go back to the Peru with her, without her parents. And, and if she didn't do that, that she would be subject to deportation, a four-year-old. And uh, when I heard about the case, I intervened uh, in the case. Uh, immigration services wouldn't even meet uh, with her. And that's time. Uh, she is now on, ro on the road to become a U.S. citizen. Mr. Carmen, that's that's what I like about this job. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you for being here tonight. Thank you to everyone who has been watching at home. If you missed any part of the debate, you can find the full video on 9news.com. For Marshall Zellinger, I'm Kyle Clark. Good night.